me going to, a, you know, a predominantly white institution as, you know, you only here because you play sports. But I ended up going on an academic scholarship. So I knew I had, I went in there with a chip on my shoulder knowing that I had to prove people wrong. And I knew that people were going to make assumptions of me. And, and then I also thought about, you know, I had good grades and I was able to do the work and certain things. And I thought that, you know, once I was able to prove myself that things would change. But not only would things change, but, you know, they would look at the rest of people that look like me differently, too. Because you are that example that, okay, no, we can do this stuff, too. As I, you know, start to see the world even more and then start experiences, you start to realize that, yo, um, they just look at you as that exception to their rule. But then also when you look around and your other people, you got to put on for all of them to make sure that they are able to have some of these privileges that you're, you're uh, you know, afforded. It was an enormous weight for a young man still in his late teens, but it's not uncommon. Dr. Charles Pinkney, uh, UNC Charlotte, told me uh, many black people feel that weight and have it, for centuries. Uh, we have so many communities that are so wounded and these communities are producing wounded individuals. Emotional wounds, physical wounds, psychological wounds. And what do they breed? They breed more problems. You know, because we don't have a system that is caring enough to support and guide and nurture. You know, how far back do these things go? Probably from the time that we arrived here. Rashawn Miller said he struggled to find the help he needed. The part of being black and understanding that we don't talk about mental health issues. You know, we don't talk about that. You know, I heard Bishop mentioned earlier, this is a lot of us do. We persevere. We just push through. You know, we greet and bear you. You put a smile on your face and you keep going. Yeah. For me, uh, my, my sophomore year, I ended up in a psych ward. Even after that, you know, I attempted suicide three times. All because of the the the, the layers of these masks that we, that we all talked about that we had to wear. You never, he said earlier, I never feel like I'm able to the point of being able to show my authentic self. I'm walking around here and three distinct voices going on in my head. I can't tell my boys this because they're going to call me crazy. I can't tell my family this because of the fact that they're going to try to take me to the hospital where I don't want to go. But then also if I'm going to work, I definitely can't say anything because I already got one mark against me because I'm a black man. If I'm a black man with mental health issues, you're definitely out of there. So then I'm sitting here trying to internalize everything that's going on. Dr. Pinckney says that is especially true among black men. And that report from the Congressional Black Caucus said that there is a misconception that black people don't commit suicide. We have less opportunities to cope, less opportunities for support. Um, and then you have 13, 14 year olds who are actually the head of the household. That is a lot of stress in itself. You, you got it. Six generations of men, black men in, in this room right now. And we really think about how often do you really talk about your mental health? How often do you really get to go to someone and be like, yo, I'm just sad. Or like, I'm just having a rough time. I've been depressed. Or I broke up with my significant other. I'm, I, I don't know what to do. We don't have those real conversations. Because we're not afforded those, that, that opportunity to do so because of all of the other layers that we got to go through. Because we view it as a weakness. You know, growing up, mental health issues, emotional issues were not discussed, especially in religion. But I am happy to say that in the last 15 years, the church has broken through. The black church has broken through to understand it from a different perspective now where we deal with uh, mental uh, emotional wellness ministries and I'm preaching about emotional wellness. I'm talking about my own going to uh, psychologists and somebody to, to talk with. And so it's become a whole new place and space for us so that we don't just persevere without utilizing all these uh, opportunities that we have to be whole. And uh, so, so that's happening now. Uh, within our space. It's always been within the uh, white community. White churches, pastors have always been open to it. But as you said, we, we're spiritual. Jesus can work it out. But we understand now that it's not taboo. We don't have any mentors doing that. We don't have any people to look up to. That's important for him to say that stuff. For him 
for him and for me and him. Fortunately for Miller, he took those difficult experiences and decided to use them for good. He earned a master's degree in mental health counseling and is working towards a doctorate through his nonprofit, Ustress. He now helps others like him, people who feel they have nowhere to turn. People still have that hatred in their heart. It is the most revealing part of the discussion. There must be some repentance. And that's scary. Let me return. 